Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Arun Singh, a respiratory consultant. I'm going to talk to you about ARDS today. ARDS is Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Now, as many of you would know, uh, there are different types of acute respiratory failure. The first is type 1 or hypoxic respiratory failure. The other type is type 2 or hypercapnic respiratory failure. So, type 1 respiratory failure is basically about impaired oxygenation and type 2 respiratory failure or hypercapnic is about impaired ventilation. Let us talk about type 1 respiratory failure. In this, you have acute hypoxic failure which is due to increased lung water, there is shunting, there is a mismatch and there is hypoxia. Basically, the PO2 is less than 60 millimeters of mercury or less than 7.5 kilopascal. The saturation levels when measured will be low as well. Now, when we talk about hypercapnic respiratory failure, Clinically, you find that the patient has got respiratory muscle fatigue, they've got tachypnea, they're using the accessory muscles of respiration. There can be central hypoventilation or there can be respiratory muscle weakness in the peripheries. These patients will have a PCO2 more than 8 kilopascal along with the hypoxia. They will have respiratory acidosis, they will have tachypnea or respiratory rate above 30 to 35. And if the CO2 levels are very high, they can have altered sensorium from CO2 narcosis. Impaired oxygenation or type 1 respiratory failure, acute hypoxic failure occurs in when there is pulmonary edema. Basically, it occurs when there are pulmonary infiltrates, acute lung injury. This can have various etiologies. It can be due to infection, bacterial infections, viral infections. It can be as part of a chemical toxic injury as well. And it can be as part of, as you know, as part of the COVID syndrome, you can have ARDS, type 1 respiratory failure as well. With regard to impaired ventilation or type 2 respiratory failure. There are various mechanisms of this. It can be seen in patients with COPD. You can have this in patients with neuromuscular diseases like myasthenia gravis, motor neuron diseases. You can have it in patients who have an impaired central respiratory drive as well. Say in somebody who has an excess amount of morphine as well, they can have type 2 respiratory failure. Let's talk about the rationale of ventilatory support in respiratory failure. In regard to type 1 respiratory failure, this certainly helps correct the gas exchange. It decreases the work of breathing and it corrects the rapid shallow breathing. It prevents respiratory muscle fatigue from setting in or it reduces the need for intubation if you correct the hypoxia early. With regard to hypercapnic respiratory failure or type 2 respiratory failure, the initiation of NIV or positive pressure ventilation helps to offset the intrinsic PEEP which is generated. It helps to reduce the work of breathing, it reduces the carbon dioxide, the PaCO2 level and helps correct the pH towards normal range from respiratory acidosis. It also helps in reducing the need for intubation if you treat the respiratory acidosis early. Sometimes ventility support can help in heart failure as well. If you have heart failure, the CPAP therapy can be useful. Obviously, this is done as an adjuvant to treating the heart failure with diuretics, furosemide infusions, fluid restriction, etc. What the positive pressure ventilation does is it increases the intrathoracic pressure which decreases the venous filling pressure. As a result of which the RV filling pressure is reduced and this decreases the lung edema which in turn reduces the preload on the heart and that results in an enhanced cardiac output. Let us now talk about the definition of ARDS. So, the Berlin definition of ARDS is bilateral fluffy shadows or opacities not fully explained on the x-ray by alternate causes such as pleural effusions, lung collapse or so. And this occurs within a week of a known clinical insult. This happens in the setting of diffuse hypoxemia. And in somebody whom there is no evidence of another obvious cause such as congestive cardiac failure. Now, the ARDS can be classified as mild, moderate or severe based on the Berlin consensus statement based on the PaO2 by FiO2 ratios. If the PaO2 by FiO2 ratio is between 201 to 300, it's mild ARDS. If it is between 101 to 200, it's moderate ARDS and if it's less than 100, then it's severe ARDS. So, there is a whole spectrum by which you can treat acute respiratory distress syndrome or respiratory failure. The first way you start is with non-invasive ventilation. If it is type 1 respiratory failure, you can use CPAP which is a fixed positive ambient pressure. 
If it is type 2 respiratory failure, you can start with BiPAP or bi level positive heavy pressure. You can then have other modes of modalities such as invasive ventilation. Always remember that prone positioning is an important principle to augment CPAP therapy and to help with an invasive ventilation strategy as well. So you start with non-invasive ventilation, either CPAP or BiPAP depending on type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure. At this stage you play around with the PEEP. You then try and get the patient to prone. You can then go on to invasive ventilation. And as part of this, you also have something called as ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is a technique used for people who are for a prolonged period on the ventilator. And it's a very selective method done in tertiary centers of excellence for select few cases. Let us talk to you about predictors of non-invasive ventilatory failure in patients with respiratory failure. So people who are, whose oxygenation fails to improve within a few hours in case of initiation of CPAP or those for whom the, the hypercapnia and the respiratory acidosis fails to correct within a few hours. In these patients, if there is no improvement in few hours, then it is unlikely that they will benefit. If they are having a very high respiratory rate despite starting positive airway pressure, if there is the respiratory rate or tachypnea has worsened or if it is not reduced, again that means that they are unlikely to develop any benefit from this. If they are needing vasopressor support because they are hemodynamically unstable or if they are having multiple organ dysfunctions such as the need for renal replacement therapy besides respiratory support, they are unlikely to succeed with positive with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Just to tell you a few clinical predictors of NIV failure in patients with respiratory failure. If your patient has a very severe acidosis or a very low pH, they are less likely to succeed. For example, somebody with a pH of 7.30 is more likely to succeed, but with a pH of 6.9 or 7.1 is very unlikely to succeed with non-invasive ventilation. Patients who have an inability to coordinate with the ventilator. Very often you will find that some patients just cannot synchronize their breath. In these patients, it's important to counsel them, try a low dose of sedative, explain to them the emphasis of coordinating with the machine and try to see if this can be corrected. Then it is important to minimize the amount of mouth leak the, when, when you are giving nasal mask ventilation. And again, if there is no improvement in them clinically in based on their respiratory rate and their work of breathing and there is no improvement on their blood gas based on the correction of hypoxia or hypercapnia in 4 hours, then it is unlikely to lead to any benefit. Basically what happens with hypercapnic respiratory failure is that the there is a PEEP is basically positive and respiratory pressure. Because the lungs are not compliant, there is hypercapnia. When you apply positive heavy pressure, this counterbalances the intrinsic peak and it allows the lung to expand fully and then the hypercapnia gets corrected. Okay, let us talk about the criteria for intubation after you start non-invasive ventilation. The Number one, if the patient is intolerant to it because they can't coordinate their breathing with it and they are deteriorating. Number two is if the gas exchange is not improved, the hypoxia is worsened or the hypercapnia is refractory. Number three, it is not improving their respiratory muscle fatigue and they are having more tachypnea like a respiratory rate more than 40. Number five, if they are severely hemodynamically unstable, where they need vasopressor support or they are needing renal replacement. Number five is severe neurological deterioration. Again, this is a, a sign which should send an alarm bell ringing and you consider intubation. Now we talk about monitoring of patients receiving non-invasive ventilation. Usually this should be you monitor the level of consciousness with a standard Glasgow Coma scale. You look at how comfortable they are with the machine. You look at the chest wall movement and see whether they are synchronizing with the ventilator. You assess whether they are using accessory muscles of respiration. You check what is the tidal volume setting on the machine. You see the respiratory rate. You look at the pressure and flow waveforms if applicable on your machine. You monitor them with continuous ECGs and pulse oximetry. You check the heart rate, blood pressure regularly. Usually, uh, blood gas should be done at 1 hour and at 4 hours after starting BiPAP or bi-level positive heavy pressure. In 
usually when you start CPAP again a blood gas should be repeated after one hour and at four hours to see the improvement in oxygenation. I would again tell you that with regard to the COVID crisis we are more judicious with our resources and we do not tend to repeat blood gases so frequently if there is decent clinical improvement. With regard to the COVID-19 crisis as we have a large number of respiratory failure patients we would only repeat a blood gas if there is a clinical need for it. If the patient is clinically better, the saturations have improved, then one would not repeat a blood gas on CPAP patients. However, if your patient has NIV for the hypercapnic respiratory failure, it would be essential to still repeat a blood gas once to look for the PCO2 which is coming down. Always remember that with the current COVID-19 crisis, we have a tendency to try and keep patients on the ward with a very high amount of FiO2 and CPAP pressure and we are trying our best to avoid the need for intubation in the COVID-19 patients because we believe that patients are getting better results if we delay the need for intubation in these patients within reasonable limits if they are responding well. So we will just talk about a few principles of treatment and management of respiratory failure. Number one, you've got to make a triage decision straight away whether this patient should be for resuscitation or not, whether they should be for HDU based ceiling care or IC. With regard to their airways, are they going to be for invasive ventilation or not? If not, will they be for non-invasive ventilation or not? So you should make this decision straight away as you see this unwell patient. Next, you've got to think about the management of hypoxia. Obviously, you have to give them oxygen. You start with nasal cannula, you then go on to venturi mask from 28 to 60 percent. You can also go to a 50 liter non rebreather mask. With regard to management of hypoxia, the other spectrum is you give CPAP therapy and then you can go on to invasive ventilation if appropriate. Next comes management of hypercapnia. Uh, when this happens, you assess the cause of hypercapnia. If there is bronchospasm, treat them with nebulizers, bronchodilators. Treat a blood gas if you have corrected a reversible cause. Make sure they have no reversible cause, such as a pneumothorax or large fluid effusion. When you have ruled out reversible causes of this, you can then start. BiPAP or bi-level positive airway pressure, repeat a gas in 1 hour and 4 hours, see if there is improvement. If not or if there is deterioration, then consider if they are for invasive ventilation or not. And the last is supportive measures. By the supportive measures, we are talking about general measures such as thrombo, uh, basically thromboprophylaxis, managing bed sores, PP, uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis, making sure the patient is mobilized, making sure the patient is proning where appropriate, they are getting additional nutrition support, making sure they have a strict input-output fluid balance. All these are very essential as part of the whole care for these patients. So just to summarize there, we've talked today about what is ARDS, we've talked about the types of respiratory failure, the principles behind treating respiratory failure. We have talked to you about the two types of non-invasive ventilation, CPAP and BiPAP and the need for initiating of CPAP in type 1 respiratory failure and the need to start BiPAP in type 2 non-invasive bi-level pressure airway support in type 2 respiratory failure. We have explained to you the principles of management of hypoxia, hypercapnia and general supportive measures and I hope you have understood this and please remember that it is very important at the end of when you see an unwell patient like this to immediately make a decision regarding the ceiling of care and whether the patient should be for ventilation for HDU support or so as soon as you see the patient. Just a note to add that BiPAP or bi-level bi positive airway pressure is not to be used for COVID-19 or any pneumonia patients. It is only used in those who have underlying etiology needing non-invasive BiPAP support such as COPD, uh, kyphoscoliosis, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome and so forth. In patients who have COVID-19 or any pneumonia with respiratory failure, non-invasive ventilation should not be used as it will delay the need for intubation. It may only be used as a bridge to support the patient for a short period of 30 to 45 minutes while they are transferred to the ICU for invasive ventilation.